Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Benson and I'll be moderating the webinar this evening. Uh, welcome to this Routledge and Taylor and Francis webinar, Can Landscape Design Actually Improve Health? This is an exciting opportunity to learn from three experts in the field and we have a global audience today making it necessary for me to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, today's session will be recorded and made available uh, as soon as we possibly can. We will let you all know when the recording is available. Um, we, the format for today, we'll have three short presentations uh, from our three presenters. Questions can be asked through the chat box, but will only be answered toward the end of the session when we do the panel discussion and address some of the questions. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but we would ask you to, to bear with us. There are quite a lot of you out there. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. If you want to ask your question for a specific presenter, please let us know in the question. Um, I'll now move on to uh, brief introductions um, of our three presenters today. Uh, Chris Coots is Associate Professor at Florida State University and Chris is going to discuss the fundamental role of the natural environment, environment and green infrastructure in ecological models of health. Um, Gail Souter-Brown is Founder and Director of Greenstone Design UK Limited and Gail will focus on the implications for salutogenic urban design showing how without ecological health there can be no human health. And Catherine Ward-Thompson is Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Edinburgh and Catherine will examine the direct evidence on the health benefits of access to green space, demonstrating the qualities of the landscape that are important for physical health, mental health and stress recovery. Um, we're going to hear their thoughts as to why this issue or the issues are being largely ignored in mainstream public health research and practice. Um, and why it's so important with rising costs, uh, challenges to mental and physical health statistics and an aging population, what we can do and address both individually and collectively is extremely important. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Chris and uh, Chris is going to lead us off with the first of the presentations. Hello Jeremy, I'm ready to go. Okay, Chris, thank you very much, and your slide's showing fine. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Jen uh, Jeremy. I'm honored to be on this panel. Uh, and greetings to all around the world tuning in to discuss this critical topic. Um, getting right to it, I'd like to talk a little bit about ecological models of health and the fundamental role of the natural environment and landscape in these ecological models. So at the beginning of the era of the new public health in the 1980s, uh, there was a renewed appreciation for the ecological influences on health. The, the ecological approach it was a departure from the biomedical view that ills could be addressed by understanding individual, biological, and hereditary factors solely. So this ecological approach is a more accurate reflection of health because health is not merely the absence of disease and there are many external or upstream physical and psychosocial determinants of health and well-being. So the natural environment plays a prominent part in an ecological approach and the biosphere here in this particular model from the 1980s, the mandala of health, it forms the foundation of health and encompasses all other ecological spheres of influence. So continuing on through the 1990s, the natural environment continues to be prominently featured for the reciprocity between it and the built and socioeconomic environments. And this reciprocation results in the conditions that facilitate or hinder health. Alterations to the natural environment affect health directly and also indirectly through the natural environment's ability to support the demands of the built environment. The health map is another conceptual ecological model of health. 
And here again, the natural environment is prominently featured as encompassing more proximal spheres. Despite decades of the natural environment appearing in these ecological models of health, ecological approaches are typically only narrowly ecological. While medicine is focused on interpersonal or intrapersonal, I'm sorry, intrapersonal factors at the center of the model, public health is focused on interpersonal psychosocial factors. So in this model, uh, typically centered around lifestyle and community, right, these psychosocial factors. There is a consideration of the relationship between humans and the environment, but the environment is almost exclusively the social or policy environment. Right? In public health research and practice, the natural environment is largely overlooked, even though it is the, this environment, the natural environment, that spawned human beings and continues to provide life-supporting and health-enhancing ecosystem services. The natural environment not only supports the ecosystem services of water, air, and food, without which life ceases, but it also is the context that supports many psychosocial aspects of health and well-being. It, quite frankly, permeates all other spheres. I'll quickly list the empirically-based public health benefits of landscape conservation, knowing that my fellow panelists uh, might touch on one or all of these. Um, just uh, going through these quickly, the natural environment supports basic ecosystem services, of course, water, air, and food, no life on earth, think, uh, including human life, it can, can exist without these things. S this is stuff we learn early in our education about the hydrological cycle and photosynthesis, and these things are supported by the landscape and green infrastructure. Uh, in developed nations, it seems that we somehow forget our primordial connection to the landscape when we're accustomed to water. It magically comes from the tap and food appears on grocery store shelves. But these things are the fundamental aspects of an ecological model. Decades of trying to change individual behavior, referred to as lifestyle in that e ecological model, um, public health has now become much more ecological when it comes to physical activity. There was a long focus on, on trying to convince people to change their individual behavior, often in environments that did not support that behavior. So we've become much more attuned, in the, at least in the past decade or so, about the built and natural environment's ability to support physical activity. Social capital is another important area, empirically based area that's important for health. Uh, it's lots of public health um, research is, is looked at social interaction, social capital, social cohesion, um, but there is no community without communal space. So the social environment is important, but the physical environment influences that social environment. Infectious disease ecology, a well-developed area uh, connecting landscapes and health, uh, often not mentioned in, in talking about the, the environmental influence on, on health. Surprisingly, we share the planet with other organisms. Interactions with other organisms change when we encroach on their habitat or disrupt ecosystems. And the most common form of these interactions from landscape destructions occur between humans and vectors such as mosquitoes and ticks that are more likely to count on humans as accidental hosts and transmit diseases. Mental health, there's been decades of works by environmental psychologists in the restorative properties of nature. It's, the, it's essentially the psycho part of the psychosocial determinants of health. Nature has been shown to provide restoration, forms of stress reduction, increasing positive affect and heightening cognition. And in summary, the natural environment provides myriad public health co-benefits from basic human needs to supporting psychosocial determinants of health. The time is long overdue for the natural environment and landscape to assume the prominence in public health practice and research that it has received in decades of public health theory. Essentially, there is no healthy, sustainable future without these considerations. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is, is hand over um, to Catherine um, and we'll move on. So if questions are occurring to you, but, um, by all means send them in and we'll try and track them and get to them later. Hello. I'm just uh, introducing myself here, Catherine Ward Thompson, and I'm about to start my presentation. So. Um, I'm interested in landscape architecture as a profession and how it can improve health and the evidence on access to green space and the relationship between that and health. 
Um, and my research center and the context in which I work looks at inclusive access to outdoor environments as important opportunities for health and well-being. Um, there's a fundamental relationship between green space and well-being that has been demonstrated in the last um, few years and a colleague Richard Mitchell uh, that I collaborate with and, and Popham, a colleague of his, um, have demonstrated um, a simple relationship here in a much quoted research paper in The Lancet showing that as um, green space around the living environment goes up, so um, the cardiovascular mortality rate goes down. Now that's uh, in a UK context, that's been shown for England and Wales. In Scotland, there's a slightly more complicated relationship, but essentially one of the key uh, messages from this is that inequalities in health seem to be lower where there is more green space in the environment than where there is less green space. Colleagues in the Netherlands have looked at uh, similar relationships between green space around the home and both physical and mental health uh, characteristics. And they call the effect of vitamin G. They notice a relationship and is particularly strong for children and for lower socioeconomic groups. So that underlines that green space around the home may help reduce health inequalities that we otherwise see where in general, lower socioeconomic groups have poorer health than higher socioeconomic groups. Uh, Chris has already mentioned some of the potential mechanisms linking uh, landscape and health, and it's worth just quickly revisiting those. We know there's a relationship there, but what is it about that green space near the home that is making a difference to health? Is it physical activity? We know that many people walk outdoors in green and natural environments. Is it the physical activity? Is it the fact that walking is good for mood and health stress? Possibly a combination of all of these. Is it social engagement? We're much more likely to bump into friends or just smile at neighborhood acquaintances, um, see other people, have social contact informally if we're outdoors than if we're indoors. And we know for older people in particular, being isolated is a risk factor for health independently of anything else. Is it to do with um, attention restoration? Chris has already mentioned this. Are um, certain kinds of natural environments in particular good for relieving attention and the, the uh, um, directed attention and um, the strain that that creates for us? And there are also uh, suggestions and increasing evidence that we have independent physiological responses to certain kinds of natural environments that, uh, whether conscious or not, we respond in positive ways. Um, our psychoneuroendocrine systems respond, um, and there's a suggestion that our immune system actually responds positively, among other things. Um, a quick mention of a study we've undertaken for Scottish Government that looked at people living in deprived urban areas in parts of Scotland that either had less green space or more green space around the home. Neither of these were wealthy, leafy suburbs. These were quite dense urban areas that were um, relatively impoverished. What surprised us was that when we looked at cortisol, the daily pattern of cortisol, and I just need to remind you here that a, a healthy pattern of cortisol is one that kicks off high early in the morning but drops steeply during the day. What surprised us was that we could distinguish between those who had high green space and low green space around their living area um, by the slope of their cortisol. The healthier ones were the ones who had more green space around the home. And we showed when we looked at men compared with women that the slope for high green space was very similar in pattern, but there was a gentler slope, slightly different pattern for men than for women, but in both cases, a poorer slope, a less healthy slope in diurnal cortisol patterns um, when there's less green space around the home. So we've got some physiological evidence now, some biomarkers that when people are in and around their everyday environment doing everyday things, it seems that the amount of green space in that environment is making a difference. 
And just to remind you, there is nothing new under the sun. 150 years ago or so, um, people were saying we need green parks in London to ensure that working people do not suffer from ill health and that artisans and labourers' health will be benefited by inhaling fresh air at a distance from their own confined and wretched habitations. So the parks movement in the 19th century, both in the UK and in North America, recognised the health value of green space, particularly in urban areas. And Frederick Law Olmsted underlined this very interestingly in words that almost mirror some of the words that environmental psychologists use today about the beneficial effects of green environments and rural scenery and the harmful effects of the urban uh, environment on people's mental and nervous system. In our research, working with people um, who are visitors to woodlands and forests near deprived urban areas in Scotland, we find anecdotal evidence like this I'm showing you on the screen that Green spaces allow people to be in non-consumption mode where they can get away from the stress of everyday life. If they're angry, they can get themselves calmed down. That kind of environment offers a real respite from the challenges and stresses of life. And these are unemployed people in deprived urban areas. And we know that design can make a difference to that. Some of our research with the Forestry Commission in Scotland and in the UK generally showed that certain kinds of welcoming design can particularly make a difference to people choosing to use or not to use nearby green space, particularly those who don't visit very often. And we've also got lovely examples of good design for stress relief and um, therapeutic uh, benefits from colleagues working in Sweden, in Alnark, for example, as this image shows a therapeutic garden that's been developed and much interesting research undertaken here by Patrick Gran and colleagues working at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and undertaking therapy with women suffering from burnout and stress uh, using these kind of garden environments and working out what kinds of um, more tended or more private or more communal spaces work well for different stages in stress recovery. So a very detailed understanding of the value of landscape design is being developed by these uh, landscape architects in Sweden. We know it's important for children to engage with the natural environment in all kinds of ways, physically, mentally, cognitively, emotionally, socially. And we have colleagues who work with school gardens and some of my PhD students work on this underlining the importance, as Patrick Geddes said over 100 years ago, of engaging wonder and emotional um, interest first and then moving to education, not the other way around. Uh, colleagues Robin Moore in the States, in North Carolina, the Natural Learning Initiative, has done some wonderful work looking at design for natural play. He's still undertaking that uh, with a colleague, Milda Costco, who undertook a PhD here in Edinburgh. And she looked at preschool children's play design and what uh, motivated children to be more physically active. Uh, an interesting study that I'm just summarizing here that she undertook is a grassy area with play equipment, uh, an area that's got um, more pathways and vegetation, but also play equipment or a more natural environment better for physical activity. And it turned out in her research for her PhD that actually Center B, the middle one, was the one where the children were most active and she was using an accelerometer to measure these children's activities. So we now know that the kind of place uh, that we should be designing if we want young children to be physically active as well as engage with natural environment and other things is one that provides, yes, a natural environment but also opportunities for wheel toys and quite energetic movement around different parts of the interested in the landscape and getting out and about as the rest of us do. Um, these are quotes from some of our researchers, uh, sorry, some of our, our participants uh, undertaking research with older people who talk about the importance of getting out and about and engaging with the natural environment.
one of the things that we've done is looked at um, how important getting uh, living within 10 minutes walk of a local open space is for older participants. And in one of our studies, we showed that older people were twice as likely to achieve recommended levels of healthy walking if they lived within 10 minutes walk of a local open space. And they were also more than twice as likely to be satisfied with life. So these local green spaces are very important as we age and into very old age, they can still be an important part of a healthy life context and lifestyle. And I will finish there with a website that you're very welcome to visit after this webinar if you want to find out more information about some of the research I've mentioned. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was, uh, that's given us a great deal to think about and I'm sure there are questions coming in. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, the next presenter, Gail Suter-Brown. Um, I think she has just managed to join us. Okay, um, I've, I've just been handed uh, a couple of questions, first of all. Um, uh, a question that's come in um, for, from John Council, I'd like to uh, pass to both Catherine and to Chris, um, which is, John has said, I'm particularly interested by the pace of change in the local environment and would like to ask what the panel think about heritage and historic buildings and the contributions these make when enhanced by green space. Chris and Catherine, could I ask you for your thoughts on that? Okay, um, do I start? If, if um, you would. Some of our work, particularly with older people, has reinforced how much um, an environment that has things that are recognisable and familiar in it can be very important and attractive for use. So, um, Heritage is something that uh, can really enhance uh, the experience of the natural environment, and that doesn't have to be built heritage, it can be natural heritage. Um, but familiar environments, something that resonates particularly with our childhood memories, can often be a very uh, attractive environment. Um, obviously, we're assuming those memories are positive. Uh, and that can encourage people to use the environment more, to get more out of it, and to find it a resource for mental well-being as well as um, engaging the brain and for physical activity. So I think uh, heritage of all sorts is, is vital, including built environment. Thank you. And, and Chris, in your turn. Uh, yeah, I, I might just add a little bit. It's, it's certainly uh, an area very far from my expertise, but it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, I was, it made me think about national parks in the United States and how these places are a strong part of our, our heritage, even though our, our heritage here is, is quite young when it comes to, uh, you know, from a, a European influence um, in the United States and the creation of these parks. Um, and I, I've seen, I've, I've often felt more of that feeling of heritage landscapes when I've been in the UK or, or other countries such as that. In Edinburgh, for example, where Professor Ward Thompson is right now at Count, Counten Hill and, and those types of places, it's certainly an important part of the urban landscape. So there could be landscapes which are complement that the heritage of the actual architecture around them. Uh, I alluded to as a on, in the U.S. on a much grander scale in those, those national parks that millions upon millions of people flood into uh, every year uh, from the U.S. and around the world. Uh, that's actually a great way to, uh, I want to say sell, but just another added justification to preserving them, constantly looking for other reasons to conserve green space, health is one of them, and heritage can be a much strong argument for doing so. Thank you for that. That was great. Okay, Gail. Um, this is Jeremy here and we've now got your first slide up entitled The Research. Okay, thank you. So as other people have probably mentioned already, there's now overwhelming international evidence 
supporting the belief, uh, the findings that absolutely landscape design can improve and affect human health and well-being. And in my book, uh, one of the opening statements was that without ecological health, there can be no human health and well-being. And that's seen across lifestyle-related diseases in particular. So that's all your cardiovascular diseases, stroke, diabetes, depression, a uh, huge impact on mental health. And that's where we've now come to salutogenic design. And uh, having missed the, the first part of the presentation, I don't know if that's been defined uh, for people yet, but what we as practitioners um, understand it to be is where we purposely design a space. And whether that's a small scale pocket park or an overall uh, city wide intervention that is specifically designed for health and well being, which is a very different approach to landscape architecture, landscape design, that says if we know what we need from the outset, we can then work towards making it a sensory rich space, well, a space that attracts in those beneficial nature points that support human health and well being. So if we go to the next slide, oh, I'll just mention on that one then, um, that view is of a rooftop garden in a department store. And that brings people into the store, people feel well, they feel their mood is improved, and they buy more. So it's working from an economic point of view at the same time as it's aiding health and well-being. So it's a really nice tie-up that the research is coming in from multidisciplinary areas from economic forums, from real estate forums, from forestry commissions, from environmental psychologists, environmental scientists, geographers like myself, and then um, have moved into the design side of things. So we've got this real cross-pollination of research that all supports the same view. And so, yeah, the metadata analysis that we use to inform our design practice absolutely puts us in the position where we say we've got to, we've got a responsibility to come up with a design response that is this salutogenic, this design to prevent um, yeah, health problems. So now if we go to the next slide and look at the history of using gardens, of using the landscape as a support, thanks. Um, first off, we've got the term there, biophilia. And all this works because of biophilia. So if um, Edward Wilson was right in the 1950s when he coined the term uh, biophilia, it describes our love of living things. And that love of living things is an innate response that, that comes deep from within us, from the evolutionary basis where we evolved on the plains of Africa with grassland and trees and in the main positive nature sort of interactions. And that's what we go back to, that's what we turn to subconsciously in times of stress. We look for that, that solace that we get from lying under a tree, from looking out over an attractive view space. So that, that was historically the start point of it all. And so over time, through the, the, um, the Middle Ages, we didn't have any sort of modern um, health or, or welfare state as we know it now. And so the monasteries used to look after the mind, body, and soul, not only of the monks, but of the wider lay community. So within the monastic monastery walls, that they would feed mind, body, and soul with the plants through the gardens. And in the main, historically, people lived very connected, socially connected, resilient, lifestyles that were in the main low stress. So very different from the situation we've got today. So we need more spaces like we're showing here with this park in um, Tower Hamlets in London. So if we now look at the current situation, the next slide, we've got the potential to take green space and it's not just enough to have the green space there available, we've got to make it accessible to people. And that says a lot about how we manage the space. So we see this in schools and preschools a lot, where they may have green space there, but the children aren't allowed to access it. So we've got to look at where we let people go, what we allow people to do when they get there. So parks and gardens, where we encourage people, the public, 
for children, the elderly, to come and sit and be part of a community where we allow people to pick and eat edible plants. Um, places like Paris are doing particularly well in terms of planting edible plantings in public spaces and people are coming down and picking herbs and taking them home in the gardens and then taking them home for their dinner for the evening. So when we've got the, the access and the green space thrown up, we get these valuable social connections. And in this disconnected, digitally connected um, world that we live in now, those social connections are often at the root of major mental health problems. We get mental health improvements, we get physical health improvements, and they all tie in together particularly effectively. We've got a, an NHS study uh, produced by uh, Dr. William Bird in December of last year, just a couple of months ago, showing a five times return for every one pound spent on a green prescription, spent on a green space connection for diabetes, for uh, stroke recovery, for early stage depression, they're getting a five pound benefit. So that's saving the NHS, the National Health System of the UK, four pounds every time they spend one, which is just a phenomenal situation. So if we now look at the next slide, we see that we have benefits across stressed populations, indigenous populations in parts of the world where the indigenous community, so we're looking here at Australia, New Zealand, North America in particular, where relatively recently indigenous people were living on the land and they have now been taken out of those close nature connections. So they have a very stark disconnect and are suffering major uh, mental health problems and uh, physical health problems beyond statistical norms. Disabled populations respond particularly well with a sensory rich landscape. Children in that developmental stage again respond particularly well. And similarly we're seeing the same sort of results through our ageing population. So the dementia interventions using nature prompts, the deep memory prompts, are shown to have astounding, absolutely nothing short of astounding impact. And there was a study done in Japan recently with um, a dementia garden and study uh, participants were taken from their secure uh, dementia unit just for 15 minutes once a week into this garden space and in the second week one of the ladies recalled that there had been a cricket singing in the first week and asked the, the researchers where was it this week and these were people who had no short term memory function at all. Um, just astounding results. So across a wide range of beneficiaries, we're seeing this very positive impact from a health point of view from using specific salutogenic biophilic design interventions. So to sum up then, the future, the next slide, shows us that we've got a really positive outlook and we have now a biophilic city movement. We're working with the World Health Organization, UN Habitat, very practically with healthy cities to create these salutogenic landscapes that create the health in the city where most of the population around the world now live, where we can in fact positively impact human health and well-being through these environmental interventions. So we can create green space in the city that feeds our mind, body and souls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. Thank you. That was great. Uh, okay. Well, we've we've got a number of questions, and I, um, I'm going to throw the questions uh, in a number of cases to the whole panel. But um, uh, Gail, we've got a question um, from Dan that says, "Is biophobia as real as biophilia? I can think of some Londoners I know who claim to be allergic to the countryside. How might it be treated?" Okay, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, biophobia is a real concern. And in some parts of the world, we've got up to three generations who have disconnected from nature, who have no lived experience. And so that fear of the unknown is absolutely real. The effect is still as profound, but we've got to break through the fear, that perception that 
nature is dangerous before we can then start the treatment as such. So the likes of um, the big disinfectant manufacturers who say, you know, we must spray all germs away at all times have uh, spread it into our psyches and so we now have this sort of idea that, no, no, um, getting a bit of dirt on us is a bad thing. So there's a lot of work to be done with some uh, population groups, but the effects are still there and they're still measurable and real, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question which, which may bring in all, in all three of you. Uh, David asks, have there been any studies that show which specific elements of landscape positively impact mental health? Specific studies, if, if I answer that one, um, I'm not aware of a specific study. What we're looking at is uh, anecdotal at this stage and certainly where we're going in and, and designing in mental health and learning disabled uh, settings, so whether they're schools or, or residential care settings, what seems to work the best is a very sensory rich environment and it depends on the actual condition that we're working with as to the types of sensory inputs that we're putting into those garden spaces. So in an autistic setting, it's very um, predictable as such. And for the, the learning disabled, this is gross generalizations, of course, in the learning disabled uh, areas, we're, we're putting in as much as possible by way of seasonal variation in sight and smell and absolutely trying to trigger those early responses that have been delayed for whatever reason. Does anybody else know of any particular studies? Um, the research in Sweden that I mentioned by Patrick Gran and colleagues at ALMA has been trying to look specifically at what is most beneficial for people with burnout and stress, um, burnout syndrome, um, and they've interestingly um, developed a classification. I can't off the top of my head remember all the different qualities, but there are qualities that in a number of studies now they've shown are important qualities for restorative landscapes, um, including qualities of serenity, qualities of nature, qualities of um, solitude or social engagement. And they say that different qualities are important at different stages of recovery from severe stress and burnout. So uh, someone in an extreme state of stress uh, early on in therapy might want a place that's very non-challenging, that is not social, where they can be alone, um, quite quiet, quite serene. By the end of their therapeutic um, uh, uh, course of, of um, work with them, they are, one hopes, ready for a much more social engagement, a much more active engagement with the garden. So they actually have designed different parts of the therapeutic garden to offer different experiences at different stages. Now that's just one kind of landscape for one particular group, women with burnout. But it's quite interesting that they have started to define more precisely different qualities and design characteristics of the landscape that seem to work better for different stages in that recovery process. Uh, I think there's borne out by our experience. Opportunity for more of that kind of research. Definitely. Thank you both. Um, Thank you both. I'll um, try to get. I'll try to get through uh, another yeah, couple uh, of another couple of questions. questions. Um, th this one's for Catherine specifically. Uh, Bob asks. Can you please describe in a bit more detail the study that showed pathways, vegetation, and play equipment had the most active kids? Sure, that's um, Neil de Costco um, working, um, doing her PhD study with us in Edinburgh, but actually she's now based in the Natural Learning Initiative in North Carolina State University. And um, she was specific, it was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded study in part. Um, as part of their program of projects looking at what encourages more active lifestyles. Um, so she had, uh, as part of her case studies, three day, daycare centers for preschool children, uh, all run by the same uh, organization, so with the same philosophy, the same uh, principles about childcare, but slightly different garden designs outside. And one had um, a grassy mound, but otherwise mostly formal equipment, 
one had a combination of more natural environments but a circular route that took the children through all of those different environments uh, that was paved and the third one was much more of a natural environment only without the equipment or the sort of paved circular route and they measured by accelerometer um, the amount of activity that the children did each day um, achieved each day and showed that it was actually that that middle one that included both hard paved circular route through the different parts of the landscape but also had places where the children could be quiet could engage with nature or um, play on play equipment but that was the one where the children were most physically active now um, they weren't looking at other aspects of childhood development they weren't looking at cognitive learning or um, a whole range of other things that you might also be interested in the focus here was on what encourages young children to be more physically active and um, Robin, Robin Moore and Nilda Kosko between them have produced um, a delightful book that I showed in one of my slides um, it's just come out um, I can remind myself what it's called um, nature play and learning places and um, they give some very good design guidance on exactly what you need to do to create the kind of play environments that will encourage that very active play in young children. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. Um, I, I've now got a question from Joanna that I think will we'll bring Chris in as well, which Joanna says, I'm particularly struck by the differences in cortisol levels with respect to persons living in economic difficulty. Chris briefly mentioned social capital, and I'd like him to address his thoughts about in the US where most healthy landscapes are in wealthier areas. Hi, Chris. Yeah, it's uh, an excellent and an extremely important question, and uh, obviously astute, uh, especially at, in urban environments where our land is at a premium. Uh, the places that are usually the, the most expensive other places that are nearest to a green space, where uh, in New York City, you know, overlooking Central Park would be the most the, the most prime real estate, um, some of the most expensive real estate on earth. So people are willing to pay the people that can afford that type of uh, privilege to to have that green space in an urban dense environment. Um, where does that leave the people that, that can't afford that and don't and don't experience those benefits then of exposure even through the window? Of their of their habitat, having exposure to green space brings about some some benefits. But but then being able to view it um, by default almost means being able to access it uh, if it's nearby. Um, so those benefits are are then kind of lost on people that can can afford to be exposed or access those spaces. So um, on the other hand, uh, in places like Detroit that Professor Ward Thompson mentioned, where there's abundant green space for the inhabitants. Um, there are benefits uh, to, to the simple presence of that green space. Taking into account, though, that some of that, that space is, is um, old industrial spaces that, that have their own pollution problems, uh, not visible on the surface, but digging a little deeper, there would, there would certainly be issues and um, health threats uh, to having that space nearby. Uh, but ecosystems are, are taking over um, a lot of that space. So, and a lot of the opportunity, too, that was mentioned earlier with, with having that abundant green space nearby and people who are left in Detroit who typically are the people who weren't able to, to leave, didn't have the resources to leave the city. The people that were left behind were the people of, uh, in most need of help. So um, abundant opportunities in place like that. Um, um, and in, in studies as the, as the one that Professor Ward Thompson cited about Mitchell Popham showing that those there's actually enormous benefits in the pop, that population in particular. I'm talking about people that are uh, where health inequalities, inequalities exist, exposure and access is extremely important. So um, it's at a premium and there's enormous opportunity and people that, that don't have, actually have that opportunity are, are usually in need of it most and benefit greatly from it. So thank you. That was great. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Well, um, I think the clock is against us. We've, we've covered a great deal of ground. Um, I'd like to ask each of the presenters in turn just to do a, a, a brief concluding thought, um, a, a big ask trying to weave together all the conversation we've had. But uh, um, if Gail, I could turn to you first and we'll just move through Gail, Catherine and, and okay, Chris. Well, okay, 
Thanks. Uh, I, having missed the uh, the first part of the presentation, and my apologies again for uh, yes technological hookups hiccups at this end, but um, certainly what we're finding from a very practical point of view, being practitioners, research led practitioners, is that the research absolutely supports what we're seeing on the ground. And where we can make the biggest difference, I think, is with reducing stress across the communities. And we can do that through our schools, through our parks, and we can do that quite simply, quite effectively, and very inexpensively. And the numbers are out there, and they're on the side of landscape interventions. So in summing up, uh, yes, we absolutely can use landscape design to improve health, and yes, it's financially uh, in our best interest to do so. So that, that would be my conclusion. Um, for me, I think the message that comes out in a lot of the work that I do is um, how Im it's important to have that everyday contact with a green or natural environment if it's going to make a difference to your life. Um, we know this um, is particularly important for people who are at either an age or stage in their life when they don't have access to private vehicles or can't easily get about. Um, so that means that for young children and for older people in particular, nearby access to good quality usable green space is absolutely the key. So um, we need a variety of parks and we do need big parks and green spaces that offer variety and wilder and more natural spaces. But we also need something that's almost on the doorstep of where everybody lives. That means a lot of green space, maybe some of it very small, some of it connected in green corridors. Um, but if we want children to have that experience every week, ideally every day of their lives, um, it needs to be within five minutes of home. Thank you, Catherine and Chris. All right, and lastly, and thank you very much. This has been fantastic. I, I think it's now time where we have the we have the health theory. We have public health theory, decades of it, if not centuries of it, the revisiting of it in recent decades, and the evidence now it appears to support this this long-standing theory. Uh, maybe even enough to confront the politics of, it, of getting these things done, the practice of introducing these spaces and building these spaces. And, um, it's I, I can see it as an urban planner. I'm thinking about uh, the realities of of selling this this idea and um, often you go into public meetings that the idea of protecting the birds and fishes is is often it can be a difficult sell to certain populations in certain parts of the world but knowing that maybe and maybe human health now with this theory and, and evidence behind us is the ammunition that's needed to actually get these projects done and realized on the ground and, and the nice thing about that is doing right by humans appears to also be in this respect with green infrastructure is also good for the landscape and the other organisms that this. So maybe that, that anthropocentric focus isn't such a, a bad thing um, if we're trying to realize these things on the ground. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was, that was good. Um, it remains for me to say a number of thank yous. Firstly, to Gail, Catherine, and Chris um, for your passion, your expertise, and your flexibility in the face of technological difficulty. These kind of curveballs are always thrown at us by these wonderful learning technologies, but uh, um, it's, it's testament to human willpower that we overcame them to, to reach the people who've joined us um, this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you might be. Uh, to our audience, thank you very much for supporting this, this broadcast and webinar. We'll be in touch with you about uh, future webinars, but your support has been very special and connecting New Zealand, the States, uh, Australia, the UK um, in this webinar has been uh, uh, an impressive experience and, and I hope uh, you've enjoyed the presentation today. There's detail on the screen at the moment about uh, the textbooks that support this and also there'll be information uh, on the web, but uh, thank you for attending this Routledge 
Stroke with Taylor and Francis webinar, and we hope to meet you again online soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.